why don't uh, you bow with me for a prayer? Get us started here. Dear Lord, I thank you for this group of people that we come together to worship you, to learn about you, to learn about each other, and to study your word. And please, Lord, as we pray together, let us also remember the, our loved ones who are as well today, that they might be healing with them. And be with our Lord as she is speaking today, that she might be in Christ. Okay. Hello. We are in the middle of chapter two. Oh, grab a, grab a book over you'll see where we're at. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of starting in the middle of the chapter. Sorry about that for you know, newcomers. But it, it's kind of fun because um, we are talking about the, the scripture of Jesus walking on the water and Peter. And, are we? No, it's the storm. Well, what, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay well, sorry, I, I'll be quiet. Well, Peter, I guess he, yeah, he didn't walk yet. You're right. He he uh, he calmed the storm in this version, and then later he walks on. Right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm all right. You're right. So basically, though, there's a lot of doubt in the um the, the fishermen that were on this boat. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're coming up to. Let me just go back one. So last week we kind of ended with the interesting thing about the story is that there's echoes of the Jonah story in it. Because if you think of Jonah, you know, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, but, but you know, God said, fine, you have to. So he gets on this boat to escape, but then there's the storm and all of the sailors in this boat were saying, go ask your God to save us. He didn't. <laughs> And so they threw him overboard, and that's when God saved him because it was it was basically he was the Jonah that got thrown into the whale's gut, and then <laughs> and then God God actually did calm the seas. All right, so we're kind of talking about God has the power to calm the seas in the Jonah story, and now here we are. Jesus has the the, the, the synonyms are that, that Jesus has the has the power just like God does to calm the seas. And for the first century Jews, that was quite a, an awakening because Jesus is like God. You know, so everybody's going, well, wait a minute, is this God? Is this Jesus? Is he is he human? Is he is he divine? And so that's where there was this, there was still a lot of doubt. Let's just put it that way. Unfortunately, in Especially in the in the book of Mark, we've been studying that quite a bit lately. And in the book of Mark, the poor disciples doubted him all the time, all the time. So, so Jesus kept going. Let me say it again. Let me explain this to you again. So, in this particular, um, let me try to get in the middle of our scriptures here. Um, if anybody wants to look these up, as because lament. I have kind of a special place in my heart for lament psalms. And um, this basically means that if you look at the psalms, there are there are song, psalms that are praising God. And then there are psalms that start out with just, just this poor person is in anguish. You know, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you think about that's what Jesus was saying. You know, he went into Gethsemane and said, God, why are you, have you forsaken me? And so we're talking about a lot of parallels between um, the lamenting. And in our story, it's this lamenting of the of the um, of the disciples. You know, it's like, save us, God, save us from the storm. You know, and and what I had forgotten or didn't study very well when I was younger was that Jesus was actually asleep in the boat and so they woke him to say save us from this storm so there this is this is where we're starting to talk about this reciprocity with god um it's it's intimacy between community and divine that's what the psalms are all about you know it, it's about you know pouring your soul out to god and then god responding to you so that's that's kind of where we're starting here did you want to hear psalm 22 sure yeah oh, you got a, song? a very 
very first part of this. Okay. Sound very familiar. Okay. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. That's just the first, second verse. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, it, it's a really good exercise, you guys. If you're ever feeling down, or if you're feeling like you need to talk to God, and you kind of want to pour out, there's a lot of exercises you can do with writing, but this one's a really good one for me, where you're you're actually pouring out your pain to the Lord, you know. And then if you keep writing, the surprising thing about this is that if you keep writing, there's a calm that comes to you. That's that's kind of what Psalms did for the psalmists, you know. It's like you can get an answer, you can get a response from God, and it's basically, I think, in my mind, it's God asking you to talk to Him. Just talk to him. Yeah. Just pray. Just please go ahead and give your burdens to me. So here we've got this word teacher um, in this particular. Um, they're, they're calling him teacher, but he, he scolds them because they really haven't learned to trust in him or have confidence in him. Remember, he's in the boat when the storm comes out. And so he, they got their their Lord. They've got Jesus in the boat with them, and 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 he had just he's exhausted. All right, he had just spent the day, you know, feeding thousands and arguing about the scripture with people. So he really was. There's actually in the scripture he's exhausted. So you know, let him sleep, kind of a thing. But instead of letting him sleep, they didn't have confidence that when this storm came up, that that he was there, they would be okay. And so that's why, why didn't they know that they were safe? Because Jesus was on board. And we, we talked about this a little bit last week too. The other problem is, is that these disciples were fishermen. So, so you would think if the storm comes up, or I think somebody pointed out in our class last week, it's like, why did they even go out there when they saw the storm coming? You know, I mean, they, they didn't use their own knowledge. They didn't trust in him. They didn't trust in themselves. So they're kind of a mess, you know, and, and and that's kind of what Jesus is saying to them is that he is their teacher by word and by actions. So all he really had to do, he, he, he woke up, he rebuked the storm, and then the storm calmed. And he says to them, you know, you guys, you failed again. You know, why don't you listen to me? Poor Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> So they were saying to him, don't you care about us? You know, and it's just exactly like the sailors saying to Jonah, you know, go pray to your God. So they, they wouldn't they wouldn't do it themselves. They would just say, it's your job, you know. And so they've abdicated their own responsibilities. You know, that's what I think that's probably what Jesus was more upset with. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of like a parent. You guys tell me a parent. Your child wakes them up to, to do something that they could have easily done themselves. <laughs> is that is that happened? Yeah. Just, yeah, just, yeah. Here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like uh, Amy Gillivine, for those of you who don't know, she is a wonderful scholar. She is actually a Jewish lady, and she writes these books and she teaches um, the college at the college level. She teaches New Testaments to these kids that come in, both Christian and Jewish people, to this college. And her argument is, you know, Jesus was a Jew, <laughs> and Jesus was speaking to the Jewish people. So he was speaking to them about their own scriptures. And so she's got kind of a fascinating take. We've, we've loved it in this class because she has this different take on the New Testament. And sometimes we agree and sometimes we disagree with her. But she's always talking about, okay, what what did Jesus mean when he was talking to the people in his lifetime? He was talking to his people. So um, Amy Jo Levine talks about there's there's different translations of what Jesus said to the storm, and "peace be still" is in most of our translations. Um, but she likes the fact that Jesus told the sea to shut up. <laughs> Thought that was kind of funny because there's actually versions of it that he says that. You know? I'm not sure it's the word "shut up." Maybe in the 
in the um in, in some of the versions, but he's basically rebuking the waves. So I kind of wondered. Let me see. Um, what what do you guys think about what is what is the point in in this particular point of why is Jesus rebuking the waves? Do, do we have an answer to that one today? Because they interrupted. Because they. <laughs> But he's not rebuking them now. He's actually rebuking well, the sea. He's rebuking the sea. Oh, the sea they, woke him up. Well, no, the sea. The sea was the reason. Turning. Turning. Yep. Turned kind up his that. people, and then he they woke him up, and so yeah. the speed started it. Okay. Okay. That's one. That's one. I, I, I do think that yeah, some of it was his irritation, but some of it was. He so had he had such power over it that all he really needed to say, you know, was kind of like this snap, you know, this the snap decision that he could that he could make, you know. So the, the the point I think in this particular scripture is that Jesus was calming it like God calmed it in the Jonah story. You know, that was how fast he did it. That was the kind of power that he had. He had the same power that God had. Um, I can't ever pronounce this word. Anthropomorphize. 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 So in this in this version, in, in Mark's version, he does like what you were saying, Coral, he does anthropomorphize the wind. And so this is um this is this is this respect for nature. I think we talked about this a little bit too. It's like, you know, Mark has this respect for nature so that it's it's a symbiotic reality you know relationship that's what this reciprocity word means you know it's like god and man god and nature it all is connected to each other so he so i do think that that at least in the book of mark this story is said in a way that we are respecting nature because that's what, what God does. And then we've got some more psalms if anybody wants to look up one about this theme of respecting nature. I've got 65. Okay. Arlene, you look up 65. Okay. I'm, trying, I'm going to get through this chapter. Okay. What was the verse? Seven? Oh, sorry. Seven. 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 Oh, look at, look at this. Uh, Amy Gillivine is so funny. You guys recognize this? We've got oh, three of them. Yeah. <laughs> blow dry Jesus. <laughs> she called him, him blow dry Jesus. And so the interesting thing about this story, though, I mean, this is a very, very common. I mean, how long has this picture been around? You know, forever. I remember in the 70s. I didn't look up when it, when it was. It yeah. used to be on those fans we had on, you know, paper mm -hmm. selling. Right. That's true. That's true. I remember that. So this guy Solomon is the one that paid him in. But I, her point was, and somebody correct me if I'm remembering the chapter wrong, is that you know she really did think that Jesus in the story was was forceful. You know, so she was saying, you know, I don't know if this version of Jesus would be saying shut up to the wind. <laughs> you know, blow dry Jesus. So she kind of has in her mind a, a kind of a stronger. You need to be a little <laughs> Well, in the wind. <laughs> Here's the, I don't know when the blow dryer was invented. <laughs> Before. Here's the song. Okay. I'm going to read from. Read, read the three. Yeah, there you go. Um, you answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring seas in the roaring of their waves and turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where the morning dawns, where the evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. This awe of nature. I've got 89.9. Okay. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. 
Okay. Once again, remember, we're talking about Psalms. So this is the Old Testament. This is how the people thought of God. You know, God has that control. We talked about power of, over nature, dominion over nature, and whether that means that we are also, um, we have the responsibility to take care of, of nature. So I think that's where Mark and, his, and Angel of Eden in this particular chapter is really emphasizing that for. So then she talks about this debate of what the word pistis, which means trust or faith in Greek. And so there's different, there's different, there's a debate about what faith means. So if you look at the epistle of James, which we're not studying it right now, but there's there's this argument of faith is a belief system. So that's when we get into this faith works debate. You know, you are saved by faith. You are you know, or you have to work for it kind of thing. But but Amy Jill Levine argues that this particular story is when Jesus says the word faith to his disciples, he's actually saying trust. He's using that word in and the, if they trust in him, and he's more concerned about action than verbal instruction. That's that's Look at the stories of Mark. It's really more about action than than just stories. And so, what he's saying to do his disciples is, when he uses the word faith, he's using that word in the sense of, do you trust me? Do you trust in God? Do you trust in yourself? That's what that word faith means. You know, earlier you talked about um, how the disciples with him at that point in time were fishermen. And if there's a storm arising, they should know that not to go out in, uh, on the lake, on the sea. And and it occurs to me that maybe trust is the is the essence of it. Maybe they don't worry about that because Jesus is with them and they do have trust in him. The problem is he falls asleep. <laughs> so then their trust wavers. And then their trust wavers. And so then they have right. to wake him up in a panic. Yeah. So I, I I like the idea that it, in this particular case uh, it's, it's translated more as trust. Than yeah, faith. yeah. And in in Matthew's version, it's that famous you know ye of little faith. For you know, I mean, he's really kind of uh, chastising them. But I like I like what you said, Jonathan and Amy Jo Levine said that too. They're working on it. You know, I mean, it's like we're all this work in progress on what kind of faith we have. You know, and, and Amy Jill Levine, especially, she had a grandfather that was lost at sea. And so she looks at this story, you know, very literally. You know, she says, yes, um, th there's definitely a story here to have faith. But then these fishermen also knew that sometimes the storm wins. You know, I mean, we've, we that's what happens. And so they were kind of still at sea in this moment. They're trying to move the right direction. But just like you said, Jonathan, there's this moment. It's like, ah, wake up, wake up, Jesus, if we need your help, you know. <laughs> so that kind of makes sense. Interesting to me that Jesus falls asleep in the boat. Yeah. And then expects them to trust him. But then in the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples fall asleep. <laughs> and Jesus chastises them for falling asleep. Maybe they trusted him too much. <laughs> So what, what they're just all exhausted. Kind of they're exhausted. <laughs> well, and that's when that's when he also said to God, "Take this cup from me." You know, yeah. so I I find it I find this Jesus story is fascinating because he really is, and I know this is hard to get our heads wrapped around, but he, he really is all human and all divine. So when his human side pops up, maybe we need to be a little more understanding of him, and then when the disciples. Human well, I just, I'm just wondering now, and yeah. uh, by the time they got to Gethsemane, they're thinking, oh, Jesus has got this. Well, they do. A little nap is not going to hurt That's it. That's true. Well, and you know, sometimes when you get so stressed, sometimes you just can't stay away. Well, you that's just... what happened to Jesus in the boat. He didn't give them that same, you know, leeway. Maybe. Yeah, that part of the story isn't in there. Yeah. I kind of like that. So, um... We're looking again at. Um, I'm gonna go back, you guys, because I got it. I got a. Somebody get our Mark scripture. I'm just gonna go back again. Oh, a part of your plot. 
Well, I'm just gonna go, I gotta go back and actually read our scripture again. There it is. Here it is. Okay, so look. This is our scripture, and and what, what we're doing in this chapter is we're going through all the different parts of here, parts of it. So I want to read it again just to remind myself and others what, what parts we're looking at. So that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. So this is the Sea of Galilee. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. All right, so there we go. That's our little, I've reminded myself what the heck I'm talking about. And Amy Jill Levine, I think, asked, who are those people in the other boats? Yeah. What, what happened to them? I know. That was interesting, too. But if you calmed the sea, and they, were they, they were safe, too. They, 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 yeah, they saw Jesus there, too. It doesn't seem like they're very smart fishermen, though, if they were all out on their boats when the storm was coming in. Well, you know, but it, it may have come up suddenly. Storms do sometimes. Yeah. And did, I was watching the show last night, and they were talking about the Great Lakes and how Storms come up on there was you know just out of nowhere. Yeah, what was that boat that That's was there? Lost? It was a song. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah, many, many more. The, the yeah. Great Lakes are much bigger than this lake. Yeah, um, much much bigger. So, so we talk about this fear, you know, and whether fear is the same as awe. Um, the way our author talks about these words is that fear is the beginning of wisdom. If anybody looks up the Proverbs, what's that Proverbs? Well, I got the Which one do you Psalm. Have? Psalm 111. Okay. And number 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Yeah. I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, fearing God and, and what that means. And I kind of like her her take on it, you know, it's like, it's not necessarily fear, like how we see fearing a great fear. It's not even awe. It, it's the word respect. It's this, it's this respect for God's power. We recognize the power. So these, what these disciples were doing that day is that they were respecting Jesus having that power. Go ahead. So Proverbs, Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So well, yeah, that's Proverbs. Think about that. Interesting. Exactly. Right. I don't know. How about that? So it's recognizing God. They recognize, you know, this was a big experience for these disciples. They recognized that when Jesus rebuked that wind, that was him showing his power. What, what Jesus can do. He can do what God does. So who is this man? Um, it, and and you know, we talked about this at, at some point because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have kind of this, this I would say, somebody yeah. correct me. <laughs> I would say they see they see Jesus as as a man, but they also see him as God. And so Mark allows the readers to determine that Jesus is God. But then he also shows that there are times when, when Jesus is human. And so there's kind of that leeway in Mark. When you get to the book of John, the book of John is very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because once John is written, and it was written after the synoptic gospels, it was, it was decided that Jesus was God. There wasn't this this um, question like what we have in in this. 
So the word was with God and the word was God. That means that's who Jesus was. And if you if you take it all the way to the community of Christ scriptures, Joseph Smith put it in the Genesis, you know, that, that Jesus was there in the beginning with God. So it's this, this progression of Christian thought that Jesus is God. It, it, it took him a lot of years to actually decide that that was true. I mean, the first hundred years of Christianity was them wrestling with the, the, you know, the relationship of Jesus and God and the spirit, you know, the, the, it's called the apostles creed, the three in one thing didn't come about immediately. This is these guys all trying to figure it out over the years. And this was kind of the beginning of that debate um, of, of this, this particular story. So I've always loved this scripture for the symbolism that Jesus teaches us that we can still our own internal storms. That's why that's why the Psalms are so important. That's why you can look at Psalms for whatever mood you're in. You know, you can look at them when you're lamenting. You can look at them when you're praising. You can look at them like for wisdom, like we just saw. You know, the beginning of of uh, knowledge is is actually looking at um, who Jesus is and how. He can help us and still our own internal storms. So if she actually, Amy Jo Levine doesn't like the allegory of the sake of the boat. But I was thinking about it. You guys go go look at our sanctuary when we walk in there. Because it, I mean, who can tell me is there is there a better version of the story of why do we have an upside down ship in all of our sanctuary? What do you think? In early Christianity, yeah. They were being persecuted again, so they would worship in, under the boats. They that would were they upside would, down at the shoreline. So that water they were would literally, not they were literally they turn their, they would turn the boats <laughs> over to keep them from getting filled with water, right? When right. they were on the shore, right? And so they would go under there, and that's where they had them. Um, that's where also the sign of the fish. Yeah. They would, do that and they'll stand with their toes to kind of connect with each other quietly. Okay. At least that is the rhythm. Okay. And I, I, so I hope it's correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I don't know if that is historically correct, but I, yeah, that, that I mean, sounds I, familiar. I, it's in our Sunday school books from when I was a teenager. I don't remember that. So now what go what find the book in the basement. What Amy Jillette Levine says, and this is this is once again kind of you remember there was a lot of turmoil in the early Christian church. And then so when they were trying to decide who Jesus was and how it fit into the God Trinity and that kind of a thing, people had different theories. But then, you know, when the when the decision was made of how Christianity was going to move forward. Anybody else's theory was then heresy, you know, <laughs> and they kicked them out. That's why they, when they decided on what was going to be in the scriptures, there were some that didn't make the cut, you know, because they were heresy. And so what Amy Jill Bing was saying is that's the allegory of this quote, that it, it's buffeted by waves of heresy. So that's how she looked at the history of Christianity, which I thought was interesting. I mean, I didn't have thought about it that way. I think about it in terms of just, well, I always thought of Noah. I thought we were just like, no. I don't know. And that's why that's why it's upside down. It, yeah. You know, in, in church, it's, yeah. it's a symbol of what it looks like and how it's doing. Yeah. There's lots of those symbols. Noah is one. What we're talking about is one. Uh, Paul and everybody who got shipwrecked. That's you know, how God saved them, even though they ship were wrecked. <laughs> so yeah, you, you, can, theme. you can choose whichever theme or That's symbol true. you like and, and make meaning out of it. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's every one of them that to determine that it's free. Exactly. <laughs> so, and then she and then she points out that, you know, like literally people are lost at sea, we need to remember that, you know, we've got a lot of natural disasters, we've got a lot of climate change, and, you know, who's got the power? To change this, I mean, obviously God has that power. We, we learned that from this lesson, but 
Jesus was saying to his disciples, you don't have any trust, you know, in me, in God. And part of that trust is doing things yourself. I mean, they're fishermen. They could have, you know, woke, you know, started paddling back to shore or whatever it is that the fishermen supposed to do. And then woke them up and said, help me, help us. You know, I mean, there were different things that the fishermen could have done. And I do think that that's part of this lesson is that we're saying, wake up, look around, look what nature, look what issues we have. What can you do? Say it again. I liked her last paragraph. Read it to us. Finally, we can also bring the story into the present to think about the weather, catastrophic floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, tidal waves. Given the impact of global warming on the weather, the account reminds us that sometimes stealing a store, storm requires a miracle. I've had those moments when governments or individuals ignore what the scientific data says about climate. I want to ask, do you not care that we are perishing? Wake up! <laughs> <laughs> That's Amy Gillaline saying that. That's good. That's good. So I thought it was kind of funny that she called it a salad sermon. Let us take this trip. Get it? Get it? <laughs> Else <laughs> so you know, I mean, even though even though Jesus is making a commandment to his disciples, he's also inviting them. I think that's what the point is here. You know, whenever whenever you see these words, let us do this together, you know, it's it's Jesus as God, it's Jesus that is commanding, but he's also being more inviting. So I do think that Mark and, and Amy Jo Levine both point this out, that Jesus, they, they accepted him as he was, that he was, you know, that he was full of him. You know, I mean, I do find it interesting that it's very clear in Mark's story that Jesus was exhausted, you know, and, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering what your guys' reaction to that is, you know, I mean, does that does that jive with your viewpoint of who Jesus is? That you know, like maybe he needed a break. Or does that or is is he God that he's supposed to not get tired? Yeah. Or, no. What do you guys think about that? I think yeah, he can get tired because when the woman touched the hem of his robe, he he felt energy leaving us. So I imagine after he did all that preaching, all that healing, all the miracles that, yeah, it took a lot out of him. And that part was fully divine. I mean, yeah. fully human. Yeah. I kind of like seeing Because if he were inside. only, if he were only divine, then he wouldn't get tired, right. I would think. Right. Any other reactions? Well, there are other places in the scriptures where he goes to be alone to pray. I've always viewed those as times that Jesus went to kind of re energize himself. Like, uh, oh, yeah. Before he, he started his ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Self care. Yeah, self care. That is that is something that's a lesson to learn. He, he took care of himself quite a few times. Even, you know, I consider that story of, of Gethsemane, him kind of gearing himself up. He knew how hard it was going. You know, and he did end up saying, your will, not mine, even though he kind of had a moment of like, ah, take this cup away from me. He figured it out. I've, he I've always, always came through. Yeah, I've always felt if if he's truly, totally divine and never really human, then where's the lesson for us? Yeah. Where does it, where does his life and ministry Say to us that this is something you need to do, right? Uh, and and so I I like that he was yeah. I I do think that's part of what his frustration with his disciples is. You see, keeps telling them that they can they can do this too. They can, you know, recognize divinity. They can have some of the power. You know, I mean, I do think that that is part of what he was trying to say. So him sleeping showed his trust in him. I kind of like Paul's take on it now. 
Jesus sleeping showed his trust in his disciples at that time. You know, but, but then later his disciples slept and that didn't mean that they trusted him. That's interesting. So what do you guys think about the connection with the Jonah story? Do you like that? Yeah, it was a new way to think about it. And really put the two together. You know, the more you stu study the Gospels, the more you see that there are echoes of the Old Testament all the way through. And I think part of that is the writers are trying to connect with Judaism. They're trying to say, hey, this is a natural next step. And so it, it doesn't surprise me to see the parallels between you know, the story of uh, Storm at Sea and Jonah and, and many of those stories. And, and even some of the psalms, when the, the wording is identical almost between what Jesus says and what appears in the psalms. So that's that intertextuality, I think. Intertextuality. And I, and it, did, it, it did take a Jewish lady to remind me that there are so many parallels. You know, I mean, I do think from a Christian perspective, we take some of what Jesus said as, oh, that was Jesus that uh, yeah. Yeah. first said it. You know, and it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus knew his scriptures, first yeah. of all. He, he was able, and that's why, you know, the book of Mark is written, I think Amy Jill Levine um, recognizes that Mark wrote in the sense that he, he assumed everybody knew the Torah. Everybody knew the Old Testament. So he was writing in kind of in paraphrase form. So those of us who grew up as Christians were all like, we, you know, we didn't know our Old Testament the way we should have. Let me just point yeah. it myself. <laughs> then we're not seeing that intertextuality. Yeah. We're not seeing that connection like with the Jonah story. So, well, and that's why the disciples probably you know, their thoughts about Jesus didn't leave them maybe they said this guy must be a god. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were thinking this guy must be a prophet. Mm -hmm. He's doing what Elijah did and mm -hmm. uh, what Elijah had done, but the Old Testament prophets had come with Moses. Mm -hmm. And so that those kinds of stories were not foreign to them. Right. Well known. Right. And so that may be part of the reason that they were slow to pick up on some of the innuendo that right. more than just Right. So when Jesus asked, who do, you, who do, you, do they say I am? You know, I mean, they, they, yeah, this is one of the prophets. Right. right. They, they thought, well, and unfortunately, they also thought, okay, you know, yes, he, he's saying things like the prophets did, but they had this vision of who the Messiah was, that it was going to be somebody that came in in this power mode, you know, and take over like a king. And I think that was part part of the confusion of the disciples and obviously of a lot of the Jewish people is that he wasn't the Messiah that they were expecting. You know, he came in with this gentler, here's what the kingdom of God looks like version versus, you know, he's going to come bring the army and, you know, kill all the Romans, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, what do you guys, do you have something? Yeah, okay. I, I... I am trying to. I don't speak. Yeah, but, um, I am new to your class. Um, and one of the things that is um, unusual about me as a person is that I take when I read the Bible. I take it absolutely okay. everything in. Okay. Uh, which makes it all of a sudden you have some really strange things that pop up versus what we normally hear in church. Right. Um, so to get kind of closer to what you were saying, um, Matthew 5.17, um, where Jesus says nothing in the scriptures is going to go away until the end. Um, so literally, he's saying the Old Testament is still valid even while I'm here. Sure. And so yeah. um, 
that's uh, a thing that makes this particular concept of um, whether Judaism is a thing of the past really difficult to understand because all of a sudden it's right at the heart of Christianity yeah. also. Yeah. The second thing is, is um, uh, I worked hospice for a lot of years. Um, and one of the things that I saw that was really helpful to folks go to church is why are you here? Um, most of us go to church because we believe. But in hospice, when I'm sitting by your bedside and I watch you let go, that's faith. There's a difference between believing, living in belief, and then all of a sudden, you're just trusting completely yeah. in what you know. That's where that trust word comes up. That's why trust. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that the word pistis in Greek means both of those. It means both faith and trust. So I think you're absolutely right, especially at an end of life. That That's where, you know, it's, it's no longer a, a debate whether, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> you, you've got to this decide in I that got. moment. And that's wonderful that you're able to to witness that, you know, because it, it's scary if, if they don't have it. And I see people, I, I have seen people too, that there's that peacefulness mm -hmm. once they finally, you know, they kind of they accept where they're at. And then there's this trust that, you know, God's going to take care of it. So that's really, there you go. That's what the story is all about. You I know? think in the, um, when they're in the boat, they're worried. For their life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're not worried about heaven mm -hmm. because they trust right. they wouldn't have gone with Jesus. Right. Right. But they're worried about their life. Yeah. Jesus, who can die when Jesus is around? Right. He keeps raising people from the dead. So yeah. obviously, it's not an issue with him about whether somebody's going to die. Or and I think that that's what you're looking at. The story is they're showing belief and he's showing trust. Yeah. Well, and then and then there's this groundedness. You know, part of the scripture is talking about how um, it, it, the, the story really tells us that we need to be grounded in now. You know, that it's about trusting the Lord now. It's not about you know what's going to happen after after we're gone and what heaven looks like. You know the, the kingdom of God, and Jesus kept saying it to people. It's just they, they didn't they didn't get it half the time. <laughs> you know, but here's what the kingdom of God looks like. You know, and he, he he keeps telling us what it looks like and what to do here. You know, and I think you know in in all religions, I do think sometimes we get too caught up in you know we what what are we are we good enough to go to heaven? When in truth, you know, you sitting with a person in hospice. That's what Jesus was talking about, you know, just sitting in there and being there with a person. That's, in my definition, that's the kingdom of God, you know. And so it's really about emphasizing now. And I do think that's what Jesus is trying to say to the people is trust me now. You know, I also think that <clears throat> we have a tendency to think that we're living in new times. But. If you look at the whole whole history of, of the world that we have experienced, that we know of, we go through cycles where we go back to the old thing. And it may look different, but the, the basis of it's still there. Hate is always there. Yeah. Love is always there. Yeah. And it's always a struggle between the good and the evil. Yeah. And so... Everything that's old is new, and everything that's new is old again. You know, it, it it's a cycle. So, you know, that's where the the scriptures connect with us today, even though they were written, you know, a millennium ago, because things are in that still in that same cycle. Well, and just like the disciples, we're on a journey. 
You know, sometimes we have a lot of faith. Sometimes we falter. Sometimes, apparently, Jesus has to say, wake up, you know, <laughs> to us. So what do you guys think about, I, I, I have a question about what this word wake up means. Is there is there also a connection to the resurrection story? Is this, when you're thinking of, of uh, what Jesus is saying about wake up to the storm or wake up, you guys see it as a as a resurrection story too. I had a, I had actually a hard time with this one. So somebody somebody who kind of looked at it. Okay. That's a stretch for me. I'll yeah, yeah, it really was. <clears throat> I mean, because he's he's saying to the to the storm. No, I don't know. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Go ahead, Terry. Um, reading this chapter and some things that he said brought to mind something that I really hadn't thought about for a long, long time. And I hope that this is relevant to what we're, what we're talking about this morning is that the person or the unusual. And sometimes seeming an impossible situation. But I thought uh, heard back to me something in my own history that I was thinking very often of less than a minute. And that is a flood that we had here in Kansas City back in the 19, I think it was 51. 50. 51 was one. Oh, 51. 51. And anyway, it was one of those every 50 year adventures. There is flooding and catastrophe. And um, I was a kid and one of my teenagers were going on somewhere back when that, when that happened. And I remember going, being part of it when the water, uh, the flood, uh, flooded almost all of Argentine and Rosedale parts of Kansas City, Kansas, and also parts of Kansas City, Missouri. And it begged the question of where are people going to go who were displaced from their homes there? And there were all kinds of things. But I can remember we, our family lived about two miles north of the Armadale um, area there. That was fully flooded. And so on the 13th of July, I can remember going out and sitting on our front step as I watched people walking, some with their dogs and animals, and some all by themselves, suitcase in hand, and they were heading right past to our home. And my mother and my father had uh, made arrangements for one family to stay with us. We had uh, well, they lived down there because they were really But it was an estate, but others were coming back up. And what was amazing is uh, how many homes were willing to take strange families into their homes and give them some shelter and food during a period of time. I had never heard of such a thing happening. In my life, or in other people's life, in quite that way. And of course, we were going to accommodate this couple that came up and, and they were part of our handbag for three days. But that, that adventure was different from anything else that I've ever experienced in my life. And I couldn't help but think. And, Talking about what we're talking today about the Holy Spirit and so on. That God helps us in many, many ways, even when we don't think about it, don't do think about it because He has blessed us with some place to go stay for the night until we get things straightened out. And we want the Holy Ranger where there were many, many homes with people did do that. Were they sinners? Just like we all are. Yeah. 
you were blessed by God, yes, for quite a while. And so when I come back to reading the scripture again, uh, I hadn't read it for some time, and I hadn't thought about centuries after the flood until I read this again, and I couldn't help but thinking what you're talking about in the, uh, what was the Jesus did in New Testament times happens today in little different settings and little different situations, but it speaks to me as a God who is still working in specific ways. And I think that happened over and over and over again as part of the aftermath of that flood. Uh, I, anyway, I just wanted to share that because Thank you. Thank for you. me, it, I had never really connected the two with that particular event with what we're talking about here this morning in the uh, in the Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's the way that's right. That's why right. that when the neighbors all wake up and and uh, we recognize even their own power. Let's end with um, I've got some psalms here, and then there's a closing prayer that is part of our. I just want to read um, Psalm sixty-nine, thirteen through sixteen. So as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God. In the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your helpful, with your faithful help, rescue me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to our abundant mercy, turn to me. That's an example of a lament prayer. And I like I like Jerry's story going along with that. You know, there were so much lamentations during those floods. And then, you know, I mean, lots of times in disasters, you know, even when you think about um, the, the biggest disasters in our country's life, there's also so many stories of how people helped and got people back on their feet and, and took care of each other, you know, so humanity does, in fact, come back and, and wakes up. I like that. So let me go ahead and, and, and read to you a closing prayer um, suggested by our, our, our leaders for this, this book. Awake. Holy God, and save those who are in danger. Guide those who are lost in any kind of storm over whom any flood threatens to sleep. With boldness as your children, we plead for your attention and your aid. With humility as your servants, we ask for strength to minister to those in need in your name. With gratitude, we trust in your love and your grace. Amen. I like that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we're doing session three. Now we're feeding 5,000. I think it's the 5,000, not the 4,000. So, yeah. <laughs> there are two. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Next Sunday is the business meeting. Oh, That's you're right. right. We are actually going to be um, having a meeting um, during this time in the sanctuary. So the pastors have written, a, we've written a letter to kind of give you some um, ideas of our vision for 2024. And so we want to have just a discussion with people. So we're going to do it during the last time. I'll have um, Paula answer too. I'll have, a, I'll have him announce it too.